Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the President and CEO of the Greater Houston Partnership, Steve Kane. Hello, everybody, and welcome again. It is great to see such a fine turnout today from our public officials, from our business organizations, employers, and from other social organizations around our county. Thank you for being here. Now, we don't normally do this, but I have to recognize somebody on our team. So you may have seen the Houston Business Journal came out late yesterday with their selections for women who mean business. And I'm proud to say that I work with one of the women who means business, uh, Katie Pryor. Uh, Katie. So the list recognizes women leaders who excel and demonstrate their leadership in their career and in the community. So we're very proud of you, Katie, even though you didn't want me to say this at all, I understand. But welcome again. Today's program, we're going to be taking a closer look at the state of Harris County, one of the most dynamic, growing, and influential regions in our country. Harris County stands as the fastest growing county by population in the United States, based on 2023 data. Harris County covers 1,700 miles, and you know, in, in Texas and Houston, we can never stop ourselves from pointing out that all of Boston, all of Chicago, all of New York City, and all of Seattle would each fit within our confines with room to spare. Harris County is home to more than 4.8 million residents, making us the third most populous county in the nation. If Harris County were a state, we'd be the 26th largest, bigger than the states of Alabama, Louisiana, and Kentucky. A few other statistics that will put our county, its growth and its influence and power in perspective. Harris County has the third highest GDP of all U.S. counties, ahead of Chicago Cook County, which is fourth. We have the third largest payroll jobs which is ahead of New York, including the third most manufacturing jobs in the country. And we have the second highest number of international immigrants right behind Miami-Dade. Okay, so almost done with the bragging. Now we're gonna brag on, on our judge. <clears throat> the Harris County judge, as you know, plays a key role in managing the growth and ensuring the well-being of our residents. The responsibilities of this position are big, particularly in areas like emergency response and disaster management, where the stakes are high and the circumstances are evolving rapidly. This morning I went back and listened to Judge Hidalgo's message, her update from the Emergency Operations Center on July 8th, the morning of Beryl. She was calm, factual, gave common sense guidance, and included with we'll get through this together, which we did, and we always do, and we keep getting better as we go. At the Greater Houston Partnership, our mission centers around creating opportunity, whether that's economic opportunity by attracting businesses and growing businesses in our community, investing and creating jobs here, or opportunity for the people who live here to advance in the economic ladder, advance up the economic ladder by gaining in skill. So economic development, workforce development, those are the twin pillars for creating opportunity, and we're happy to be part of that. We work with many organizations in that regard, including working with the workforce development and the economic development team at Harris County. All of this enables us to work with policymakers, educators, employers, and social institutions across the 12 county region that we do our best to represent. You know, we especially value the working relationship that we've developed with our political leaders, including Judge Hidalgo and her team, the four county commissioners, and the other leaders who are in this room or who are represented in this room. By aligning our efforts, especially in areas like workforce development, uh, infrastructure, and resilience, we can ensure that Harris County continues to be a place where residents have the chance to succeed and our businesses can continue to lead 
Harris County has faced its share of challenges from natural disasters and from public safety concerns, but at our best, we get through them all together. Thanks to county leadership, we have made significant investments in flood control and mitigation to safeguard residents and businesses in our community. While there is still much work to do in these areas and others, the future is bright for Harris County. It's now my privilege to introduce Harris County Judge Lena Hidalgo. First elected in 2018, Lena Hidalgo is the first female county judge uh, to serve, and she's now serving in her second term, and she was only the second to be elected to Commissioner's Court. As the presiding officer on the Commissioner's Court, she steers the county's main governing body with responsibilities including adopting budgets, managing county infrastructure, and ensuring the functionality of vital county services. Judge Hidalgo also serves as the county's Director of Emergency Management, leading the Harris County Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Management. Her leadership has earned her several accolades, including the John F. Kennedy New Frontier Award, Time Magazine's 100 Next list, Forbes 30 Under 30. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Lena Hidalgo. to see you all here. Thank you, thank you so much for making it, and it's just such a wonderful group of people. Um, we do, I want to start with some really, really exciting guests that we have here um, this morning or this afternoon to start on a high note is we have uh, Shelby McEwen here. He's somewhere over there. Stand up, Mr. McEwen. And let me tell you who that is. He is, uh, he just came back from Paris. That should tell you something, a little bit about what he's just done. So he's a silver medalist. Um, and here's what I like the most is he was born in Mississippi and he got here as fast as he could. And I think that's the case for a lot of us um, and it's part of what makes our region so great. So um, I want to thank, of course, Steve Kane and the Greater Houston Partnership uh, for all of, of their work throughout the year and for making this possible. Um, I know there are some elected officials here. I saw uh, Council Member Cassix Tatum. I saw our County Attorney Christian Menifee, um, our State Representative Gene Wu. Of course, Commissioner Ellis is here. Um, thank you, Commissioner. You get a special mention. He came back from Austin to be here. And so please, um, if you're an elected official, please stand up so that you can be recognized. Thank you all so much. I see some other folks over there, so thank you so much. And of course, to the various companies, the organizations, the Consular Corps, you guys are truly what keeps our economic engine running. Um, so thank you for the work that you each do and that your team does. All the county leadership who are here, I want to thank you as well. Um, and of course to my staff uh, who've been working really hard and yesterday we're dealing with two fires, as in actual fires. Um, so so if, if you're part of um, the county leadership uh, or, or our emergency team or county judge's office, if you would please stand as well and be recognized. Thank you guys so much. I also have a special mention, I promise I'll move on, but this one's exciting, is um, my, uh, I have got new uh, decor on my finger, and, um, and that's because I'm getting married December 1st, and I just wanna take a, a point of personal privilege to acknowledge my fiance, David, is here. Um, he never goes to things, so it's a big deal for me. The last time I talked to you guys from here, it was 2019. Uh, we had only heard about pandemics from history books. 
And um, we just had no idea that something like that was coming. Of course, we had a state of the county uh, Zoom in 2020 with masks on, and uh, you know we did the best we could. But I'm so excited for Steve Kane's leadership and the whole team, and very happy to be back. All of us have, of course, endured so much over the past few years. This is my sixth year in office, uh, which I, I almost don't believe, and. Part of what we've learned is not only what it's like to live through a pandemic, but also what a derecho is. Um, we learned that because we went through that. Um, we have learned just how important our first responders are, whether it be the nurses and doctors, whether it be the service workers, the hospitality workers, um, whether it be law enforcement, first responders. And so I know um, we have several representatives here. I saw our fire chief Christensen, um, I think, over there. Um, if you'll please stand up, chief. Um, Bill McKeon is the, the president and CEO of the Texas Medical Center. If you stand up as well. Any law enforcement, first responders, please. And we'll give a big round of applause to our service workers as well. We can't talk about the state of the county and our recovery without talking about all those folks we just listed. So overall in Harris County, we've learned we're not helpless against disasters. We have made a strong recovery, 145% uh, uh, growth in jobs since the pandemic that's higher than um, other metro areas uh, that, are, that are equivalent to ours. And that doesn't happen by itself. It happens because of investments. It happens because of jobs. It happens because of people um, moving here. It happens because of you guys. But we also are working to better prepare for these disasters, to better respond to them. And I want to talk about that just a little bit. Um, part of what we've done over the past few years is advocate with the federal government so we can have more resources here in Harris County. After Hurricane Harvey, for example, the federal government allocated a billion dollars for Harris County, a billion dollars for the city of Houston for flood recovery. Um, we learned the money was uh, being held up at the state level. Commissioner Ellis and I traveled to uh, Washington, D.C. We met with Secretary Marsha Fudge, and um, the billion dollars came to Harris County. Um, so so that's, that's a big deal. I do think that deserves a round of applause. Um, <laughs> We received FEMA aid very quickly um, during the past disasters. Of course, we had the flood uh, that affected some of the community. We've ha we had the derecho, then Hurricane Barrel. And throughout all of that, we were able to be on the phone with our federal partners. I was on the phone directly with the president and vice president. We got FEMA aid in record time. And we were able to interface directly with the director of FEMA, with Deanne Criswell, as well as with her number two, to be able to fix some of the kinks. I know you guys may know or may have been recipients of uh, some of the FEMA aid, uh, perhaps some of the small business loans, and it, there's always room for improvement. So part of what we did is really take what we've heard from the community and try to work on some of that, and we're gonna keep doing that. Um, so to date, we continue to work uh, to receive aid. We've received at this point uh, $418 million in direct aid for the people that have been hurting the most after these disasters. Of course, the roofs through their homes, um, things leaking from the rain, uh, and so on and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, it's a big deal for the families that, are, that have gone through a hard time. So on the topic of preparing for the future, I have something exciting to share. And, um, and that is the, the work we're trying to do on flooding. And let me, I think this microphone moves with me. Okay, yeah, so, I have a, so anyway, um, so, so on flooding, you guys know we had the $2.5 billion bond um, back in 2018. 78% of folks voted for it, so I'm guessing a lot of people here um, voted for it and participated, and that was great. And that investment has helped us over the years in the bayous that are most um, 
vulnerable, uh, Brays, Greens, Halls, they've been able to hold up. For example, with Hurricane Barrel, I remember spending uh, the night at Transtar and chatting with Jeff Lindner, and, um, who was up all night as well, looking at those bayou levels and, and his confidence and his joy, really, that the investments we had made had actually improved the resiliency of our bayous and channels. Same thing if any one of you is, is from the Myerland area, Tropical Storm Beta, you might remember, uh, was coming after Bray's Bayou. It was, it was supposed to flood, and it didn't because we finally got that project done, the, the project Bray's. Is that all we need? No. We have all seen, um, after Harvey in recent years, the estimates that what we need to make our flood, um, our region resilient against flooding is much more that, that, than that two and a half billion. And, and here's another thing that I want you guys to know is the investments we've made in flood control infrastructure over, obviously over time have gone up, particularly with the bond, they went up a little more. But when you look at the investments in maintenance, that has been totally level for many, many years. And so what happens when you make an investment and you don't maintain it? It falls apart. Um, so what we learned, and our, our director of the Flood Control District, Dr. Peterson, um, shares, shares with me that vision that, that we can actually turn the page on flooding and that either way it's worth trying. And so what um, her team helped us design, and, and anyone here from flood control, the Flood Control Department, the Flood Control District, I want to acknowledge, um, but what she helped us figure out is we now have a ballot item on this November ballot where voters can allow us to invest in maintenance so that we're maintaining the projects we're building so that when people complain about there being too much debris in the bayou and being too much grass in the channel, that we actually have the funds to keep that up. And so as opposed to having maintenance every 270 years, which is what we could afford, we're now going to achieve industry standard of 67 years. And that was a unanimous decision by the commissioner's court. Uh, just happened two weeks ago. So I want to acknowledge my colleagues, all my colleagues, the Flood Control District, and now we need to pitch this to the voters. But it's, it's so necessary. It's a big deal. And that's really the thing I'm proudest to, of to share today because it helps us begin to turning that page. Um, so, so just a big thank you to my colleagues and to the director of, of the Flood Control District. <laughs> Flooding, of course, is one of the biggest initiatives I'm focused on right now, but we're also tackling disaster resiliency more broadly. So we worry about flooding. Turns out we also have to worry about keeping the lights on. Um, and I was one of the many people that didn't have power during barrel. Um, and, and you know, it, it felt really uncomfortable um, and frustrating until we went to see what some other folks in our community had been dealing with, um, whose own homes and cars had been damaged, even the folks whose loved ones died because of the hurricane winds. So, um, but either way, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable for us to have that challenge. And um, that's why we're trying to look towards, number one, what are the policies that we need to advocate for on behalf of Harris County so that we have more resiliency when it comes to the power, but also what can we do to continue to lead in the area of energy? We talk a big game about being the energy capital, and it's true. But we have to be able to also keep the lights on and to also keep those jobs, to keep that economic viability of the energy jobs. So I know I, all of us, we either work in oil and gas or we know someone who works in oil and gas, and um, it's so crucial to our region. And also, we need to make sure that we're leading the energy transition from my perspective on behalf of workers, right? The companies are, have a duty uh, to their shareholders to work on that bottom line. For me as county judge, I'm trying to look at the fact that there are so many people whose livelihood depends on uh, that industry, the energy industry, and uh, we're going to have to make sure that we're, that we're leading in that specifically. So um, 
solar power is one of the areas that we're looking at. It's quickly becoming a big part of the Texas power supply. ERCOT uh, was able to have enough power over the past high demand time because they had 20% uh, of the power coming from solar. So we received hundreds of millions of dollars, Harris County and several um, other jurisdictions from the federal government specifically for that, uh, solar jobs, infrastructure, et cetera. We're working hard to recognize that we cannot live right now or really soon in a future without oil, without um, plastics, et cetera. But the world is moving forward. And whether you look at it from a climate change standpoint or whether you look at it from a job standpoint, we want to make sure in Harris County that we're being proactive and that we're being very open and honest and thoughtful about the conversations that we have. You'll hear later a little bit about the investments we've made on apprenticeship training as well. And it also is looking towards those jobs of the future. Uh, let me turn a little bit towards uh, the good governance area. And um, I think there may be some slides here to show. Um, I get taller when I go over there. Um, <laughs> um, and so, like any organization, and you guys, so many of you lead organizations, is you need to have a, um, a clear mission. You want to have a good um, organization chart. You want to have a salary structure. You want to have um, systems by which to measure the impact of the work you're doing. We've been able to work on a lot of that over the past few years. As you guys know, that work is not easy. It's not sexy, but it's important. And it's, and it's really not easy, especially in a county with 20,000 employees. And so I want to acknowledge um, our Office of County Administration. We were able to build that, um, that structure according to what other counties, other cities, other governmental entities hold as the most basic structure. So what you're seeing here are some guiding principles, um, some strategic planning that we worked on uh, with the county, and then also just the structure, making sure there's consistency as to uh, what people get paid, cost of living adjustments, um, that, that we have organized departments, that the budget department falls where it's supposed to be that during budget season, we can have a clear proposal about exactly what the programs are doing that we are investing taxpayer dollars on. And so um, if anyone is here from county administration, I want to acknowledge the work you guys are doing. Um, and, and thank you. I think we have somebody there, Leah Barton. So Leah sat down very quickly, but she's the deputy county administrator, um, along with Deanna Ramirez, our administrator. She's done an incredible job, and, and she led a lot of the fabulous American Rescue Plan investments that we made, and I'm going to talk about in just a little bit. Here's another piece that, that I'm excited about, is we learned, thanks to the county auditor, that for 30 years or so, a lot of county contracts were awarded with no... Um, no scoring criteria, no scoring, no, no selection committee, no keeping track of anything. I'm really proud that we we're able to work on that and that's really partly why I wanted to title this section Good Governance is for the first time in 30 years we came together as a commissioner's court and we voted to require that every contract in Harris County be awarded through a process. And so the, the contracts that were not going through that process were flood control um, and some transportation projects with toll road dollars. It's a huge deal. Um, I mean, I know we're talking about so many things and it just kind of passes you by, but, it, but it's a huge, huge deal. Um, some predecessors of mine had tried this and it just had never been done. So we're, we still have a little bit of a ways to go to make sure everything goes to our um, independent purchasing department, but there are now systems systems that any county, any city, anywhere would have. And, and that also gives you an idea of the kind of reforms that we've had to do together just to have some initial systems. Even with that, even with the um, disasters, we've been able to get a lot of proactive work done. And so let me mention just real quick um, some of the American Rescue Plan dollar projects, um, whether it's homelessness, whether it's crime, whether it is de-letting homes, uh, whether it's early childhood education. We have done a lot of work with that billion dollars we received from the Biden administration 
Many are pilot programs. Many will be discussing this budget season to identify which ones are worthwhile expanding and, and make sure that we're transitioning that budget into the programs that actually have an impact. And so uh, when I spoke with you here 2019, before we knew what derecho and pandemic meant, um, we were talking about early childhood education about how important it is as an objective in and of itself and how we wanted to invest more in that. Well, today I'm proud to say we're making good on that promise. We have 5,000 new high quality early childhood education slots in our community for kids um, and to help those families. And so, Uh, one of the uh, early childhood leaders is, is here, and I want to highlight some, some real uh, examples here. For example, Centrice Jones, she's the director of early childhood initiatives, um, who is, I, I think should be here under Leah Barton as well. Thank you so much for making this happen. So early childhood education helps the children um, less likelihood that they will end up in jail, higher likelihood that they will go to college, uh, whatever, whatever angle you look at it from, it's a good idea. But it's also good for businesses and it's also good for parents who choose to work. For example, um, there is uh, Dion Davis. She owns a childcare facility just south of Midtown. We visited it um, here with some, some colleagues from the city and the county. And it's an incredible business. All these child care providers we work with are ranked top, top cream of the crop by the state standards. And so she's one of them. And there are children who need this service. There are families who need this service. But because of the pandemic, she was at risk of shutting down. She drained her personal savings account to keep her business going after 17 years. Today, we have created a tax credit for child care providers that we're working on to be able to help keep folks like Dion in, dis in business, and, and she is. She's in business, and she's got these, these beautiful children, um, and it was just so impressive to watch them and watch them, um, how, how confident and strong and, and just brave these little kids are, and, and they're, they're just getting not just the skills, but that, um, that, that really strong spirit and confident spirit. I also want to highlight a mother, Kaylee Quintero. She's a mother of two children under the age of three. She struggled to land a job because she couldn't afford to put her kids in childcare. But because of one of our programs, we are now um, having those two children enrolled in one of our early childhood education programs. She's got a full-time job, which is what she wants to do, and she's being able to provide for her children. The work continues, these slots are funded for two years, but they're not indefinite. We need more than these 5,000 slots, and so um, we're gonna continue to work on that. Stay tuned, but it's a big achievement, and I also want to acknowledge my colleagues for their leadership on this. Um, Commissioner Garcia has been a strong partner on this from the beginning, and really everyone on the court has been extremely supportive of our early childhood education investments. So let's give them a round of applause. We can't talk about, of course, the future without talking about crime. Uh, we had a really tough time during the pandemic. Um, we've had some tragedies, law enforcement officers uh, losing their lives in the, the line of duty. Most recently, um, Deputy Esqueda, whose uh, sister was also a deputy and um, who left behind a fiance, um, which was especially uh, heart-wrenching for me. So, so I want to just um, take a quick moment uh, to, to, uh, of silence for those deputies over the past six years who have lost their lives uh, trying to keep us safe. Part of what we're trying to do to support these folks on the front lines is um, the best way you can, which is really making sure that they're paid accordingly. We've been able to increase salaries for all of our law enforcement officers. Uh, in fact, we tried uh, to give them an additional $100 million in salaries to recruit the best and brightest um, back in 2022 at West Commissioner. Unfortunately, we, as a court, we were not able to ultimately get that, but it's certainly something we were championing um, as, as, as late as uh, last week or two weeks ago. Um, but, but crime is trending downward. 
uh, we're down 11% aligning with the national trend. Um, there are some crimes that are not trending as quickly as others, but it is an important statistic. We can't take credit for all of that. As I said, it's a trend nationwide, but we have made some really smart investments. For example, we've got a program, HEART, that is able to send um, other kinds of responders to people who are having crises that are nonviolent, so that we can free up our law enforcement to work on the violent issues where they're really needed. We have programs like Viper, our Violence Persons Warrant Task Force. There were people who had been uh, charged with a violent crime who had not been brought into custody. And there were many thousands of these people. We have now helped fulfill warrants for nearly 4,000 dangerous criminals who had been tagged as being a violent criminal. Uh, we're also tackling crime at its roots, removing structures where criminal elements congregate, abandoned buildings, uh, abandoned lots, and, and that is just a little bit of the work that we've done, so I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, on the topic of, of course, preventing crime in the first place, just like early childhood education, workforce development, making sure that people are able to have the opportunity to have a good job. Um, so we have invested more than $34 million in um, apprenticeships and workforce development programs. Our apprenticeship programs have helped train thousands. And so you see here Jordan Wise, he tried for a month to get promoted as his IT department, but he kept getting passed over. So then he went, did this apprenticeship program. It's great because um, the company leaders, they get that labor, the apprentices get paid while they learn and they work. And he is now um, in the IT department. He is, uh, used to be a janitor and now is helping fill some of those positions that we just do not have enough workers for. Uh, so that, uh, those programs are led by Empower and by um, the AFL-CIO Labor. So if there are any folks here from Labor or from Empower, please stand up. You guys are doing an amazing job training these, these folks. Um, I, I saw Linda Morales earlier. Yeah, thank you guys so much for, for this work. And, and it's really planning for the future. We overall have worked on um, funds to help jumpstart small businesses, $30 million after the pandemic, to, to try to keep those businesses going. Um, we have worked um, on um, broadband. We have worked on uh, all kinds of um, issues. Affordable housing, as we know, is a big issue as our community grows. So those are the investments that we're very, very proud to have to have made and um, you know the truth of the matter is that sometimes you forget that um, it's not normal to have th this many initiatives um, because simply the, the money is not there. Um, the tax rate had been the same rate for many years before I took office and um, actually uh, we have lowered the tax rate for the first time during each of the years that I've been in office. So, um, so that, is, that is new, that's something that did not used to happen before I took office. We've also expanded uh, the homestead exemption as much as we can and and um, we're asking now voters for support with the flood control work. Um, I was hoping and hope in the future to be able to invest in some other issues. But the infusion of cash from the federal government during and after the pandemic uh, was a game changer. Some jurisdictions had to invest it in patching up their budget or they split it four ways and people just gave it to whoever they preferred. We created a committee, and, and credit here goes to my colleagues as well. It was a representative from each of us, um, Leah Barton and folks from county administration. We had experience in this. And anybody who wanted the funds that reached out to any of us, they went through this process, and that's how we ended up with these amazing initiatives. Um, the book I wish I brought is this thick um, that tells the stories of folks like the ones we heard about, and, uh, and we're able to measure what the impact of these initiatives has been so that we can figure out which ones to continue. You. So, um, so, so look, my, my biggest message, and I'm going to end here because I know I've been going for a while, is Harris County is strong, Harris County is growing, Harris County is resilient, Harris County is united. We have been blessed with um, these resources uh, and the team to be able to invest them. Uh, as much as you don't see it, there's just so much pride and so much work on behalf of all our teams and all of us into building this into a better organization to do the people's work with accountability and um, 
with some rhyme or reason for the way it is designed. But we have to continue acknowledging what our challenges are. So that's where we're looking at um, flooding, transportation, et cetera. The last thing I want to touch on is um, the topic of mental health. Uh, as you guys know, I took a leave of absence in September of last year. Um, it was about seven weeks, and the community was incredibly kind about it. And so first, I want to thank you guys. Many of you sent me messages of support. Um, my colleagues were, were wonderful and very supportive. These are some of the cards that we received from constituents. But one of the things that has taught me is just how prevalent mental illness is in our community. I can't tell you the number of people to this day that come up to me, whatever the setting, whatever their job is, and tell me about their mental health struggles. The data shows it too, after the pandemic, many more people, especially young people, are facing these mental illnesses. So, um, that's some of what we're working on. We've invested some American Rescue Plan dollars. Um, I believe it's around $10 million to train more counselors in schools uh, to provide more support. Uh, of course, David was part of, part of supporting me as well. He was there every week, uh, every weekend in Cincinnati. Um, we're trying to train more mental health professionals. We don't have enough people going into that profession, um, but we're gonna be continuing to promote just education on that. What is depression? What is anxiety? What do these things look like? What kind of help can you access? Um, we run, uh, the, the, I don't know if there's folks here from the Harris Center, the 988 hotline, the suicide hotline that was started by the federal government. We're responsible for responding to a, a whole um, huge percentage of those calls. And so um, that's something that I want to invite uh, you to help me with as well, is to have those discussions in your family, with your friends, to, if you see somebody struggling, encourage them to seek help, uh, encourage them to see a professional, and just remember that it's something that we don't talk about enough, but I bet if we took a poll here, it is just so, so prevalent, and as somebody who lived with this for 10 years and didn't even realize it, oh my goodness, it's just, you just feel so much better. Um, so we're gonna continue working on that, and, and I know we're gonna have uh, a fireside chat here with, with Steve Kane. One of the things I'm excited to talk about is the FIFA World Cup, so I want that to be a good note. Um, but, but, but look, uh, really, everyone here is just such a testament to what our community is, uh, to how hard everybody works, um, to how much we love this community. Is it perfect? No, it's not perfect. But the fact that so many people continue to move here, even in the face of the floods and the fires and the freeze and whatnot, it just tells us this is the place to be. We're gonna continue addressing those massive challenges. The fact that there are more doesn't make us any less determined to tackle them. It makes us more determined. And I am so excited to continue working on um, more flood infrastructure, on tackling our electricity issues, and on continuing to invest on programs that help people take that opportunity and make the most of themselves to be productive members of society. Thank you guys for helping support that. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. You covered a lot of uh, will be on a global stage there. A lot to do to get prepared for it, a lot to do to have our community really shine through that, uh, and also a lot we have to do to make sure we don't disrupt local life too much. So what have you been thinking along those lines? I mean, everybody talks about, um, about soccer being a global sport, sport, football in a lot of the world. And I think we've done incredible here uh, with our Dynamo, our Dash, won a major award during the pandemic uh, or major championship.
but we also need to take a bigger part in the economic impacts of having this game that really belongs to the world. Um, so I know that everyone um, from John Arnold uh, to the folks over at the Sports Authority um, to folks with you guys have been working so hard on pitching this. The day that we found out, I remember we were all, uh, there was like um, champagne ready uh, just in case we got it, but all of us were so nervous. If you see the video, Mayor Turner was there that day and we just, um, you can tell we're just kind of hoping we're gonna get to pop the champagne because otherwise it's gonna be awkward. Um, and they, they listed city after city and then of course Houston, um, I believe it came last and we were so relieved. It's gonna be played at our Harris County Energy Stadium. I saw uh, Ryan Walsh earlier, Kenny Friedman, some of the folks that helped lead opportunity there. And, um, and so that, that's gonna be a huge deal. And we're working on making all the planning possible so that when people come, they see uh, the best of our community, they see how smooth everything is. Um, and that really takes us to, to another topic I didn't really touch on, which is transportation. And that's something that I, 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 I have to admit, I'm a little bit, um, I wish that we had more to show to show um, the folks that come in from out of town, and that's part of what I'm fighting for. Steve, before you move on to the next question, I failed to acknowledge uh, Dr. Porsa, the, the CEO of our Harris Health System, our public hospital system. And Dr. Porsa, if, if you'll stand up. Um, and congratulations. Yeah, they, you know, these folks, uh, these nurses and doctors did so much work. I visited one of the hospitals, I think it was LBJ, Dr. Porsa, during the pandemic, and it was, we were there in the ICU, and. Um, just to watch them at work was unbelievable. And the, fa the folks that continue that work, um, you know, whenever I talk to mental health professionals or folks in the healthcare profession who went through all of it um, and, and came out the other end and decided to continue, um, I just find it amazing. So thank you guys for, um, for, for your commitment and all of your teams that are still there serving our community. Very good. You covered a lot of ground on disaster uh, response and resiliency. Maybe talk about preparation a little bit. A big part of this is preparation and really all the way down to the individual level. What kinds of things should we be doing in Harris County to make sure that we're prepared as these things are headed our way? Um, you know, the maintenance piece that I talked about is a big deal. We do still need to make a larger investment in infrastructure. Um, and so we're working with the flight control department and, um, and I, I, I bring this up every opportunity I can to my colleagues is uh, what, what is the next investment on infrastructure itself? Because it is a ticking time bomb. And yes, the federal government is looking at the Ike Dyke and um, our our con congressional representatives are doing a lot of work on that, but that's a 20-year project. And in the meantime, um, it's more and more businesses and people from out of town that continue to see this unfortunate drumbeat of uh, rain and flooding, and it's more and more people that are vulnerable uh, against these kinds of natural disasters. So that's one end. On the individual level that you were talking about is, um, we, we're trying to innovate. So one of the things we work, we've worked on is bringing our nonprofits and uh, communities of faith together with more efficiency. And that's something I talked about back in 2018 that we've made a lot of progress on. Uh, when we had Barrel, uh, we were able to have an improved um, Houston volunteer site. We were to have improved coordination to say, okay, these folks cutting down the trees need more folks to haul the debris off once they cut it. Um, it seems trite, but it's important. And, um, and then something else that is, that is good is how we've learned to use the wireless emergency alerts. So you guys maybe got tired of them during COVID. I hope you've turned them back by now. But, you know, for example, um, there was a, a, one of these uh, cases without power and folks will start using their generators and then we begin seeing a huge uptake of um, carbon monoxide poisoning, including deaths. And so uh, as much as we explain it on TV, not everyone is watching. I mean, they have no power. Um, and so what we've been doing is, um, is sending the alert direct to the phone that's gonna scream at you and say, don't put your generator inside or by the awning, et cetera, et cetera. And um, it was really special, the decrease that we saw very suddenly um, before and after we sent the alert. Um, so 
you know, it's about how can we commu can communicate uh, as clearly as possible and, um, and just, um, of course, the challenge now coming up is, is um, what are insurance rates gonna continue to be? I know a lot of insurance companies are, are trying to pull out. So, so really it's that race and um, people will say, well, we gotta finish the current projects before we work on new ones. And, um, and my thought is we gotta just speed, speed it all up mm -hmm. um, because it, it really has that domino effect. Right. So you mentioned transportation in the context of the World Cup, and, uh, but there's also, you know, we've been successful. We are attracting a lot of people here. We have added like 1.2 million people over the last uh, 10 years or so. So when you get that growth, it's a good thing. I mean, it's a good thing for making the community vibrant, but then you gotta deal with all the cars and commuters and everything. So in terms of the day-to-day -day traffic management, uh, what are you thinking about at the county level that we need to be doing? You know, some, some of the doctors here will back me up on this, but uh, and just how dangerous the roads are, um, and and how many um, how many people die or are irreparably harmed by um, that car culture um, and, and the way that it forces people to drive so much at such high speeds when you have these wider roads, it just lends itself to going very quickly, ending up um, getting in a car accident. It's something I saw firsthand when I used to work as an interpreter um, in the hospital. So, you know, my, my focus and what I've been um, working to advocate on, and this is one piece where I've not come as far as I would like to, to be honest, is, um, okay, we're not gonna build uh, some sort of uh, rail system throughout the county or uh, an above ground metro like they have in Thailand or the kind of thing they have in DC or, uh, but, but why, can't, why don't we look at bus rapid transit? Um, how can we use the space that we already have to move people more efficiently, to reduce the accident rate, to reduce emissions, um, to save people time because that way they can work while they're on their way to work. Um, so that's that's one uh, one thing that that we've been trying to push for the latest project with I-45. We we worked so hard to try to get them to to commit to have a bus rapid transit lane. Them being TxDOT, and um, there's there's a, a promise there. It's not entirely uh, ironclad the way it's written, but but I'm hopeful for it. Um, we did have a bond that the taxpayers approved last year, uh, most of which has gone to transportation. Uh, my colleagues are responsible for this, and they've done a great job on prioritizing areas by schools, um, areas that have high accident rates, um, roads that we know are not up to standard, working um, also to just be able to track all the roads we're responsible for, along with all the bayous and channels we're responsible for, and what the status of all of them is. This isn't something that we were able to do before, um, but it's absolutely necessary. Um, so, so I guess to put it um, to put it simply, um, I think that our economy would do better and our region would be more attractive if we had something, um, and I think bus rapid transit would cut it, and, and I'm gonna continue pushing in that direction. Um, I've, I have talked to business owners who say, you know, I have employees who can't drive all the way out here. Um, and so, you know, that, that's sort of the economic tie. Okay, so we've got a lot of busy people. We're gonna try to bring this in for a landing now. You've shared so much today. Maybe just a little bit more on energy transition. A lot of energy companies in the room here too. Uh, I was stunned to find out that we've got like 260 startups in clean tech in Houston. About a little less than 50% of the project leads that we track are in things like wind, solar, batteries, things like that. It's really remarkable how much has happened. I, I assume you've seen the same thing, and what, what is the county's role, you think, in helping us continue to make that kind of progress? Well, you guys have done a, a really good job with the GHP, I do have to acknowledge, in, in leading the way there in partnership with our industry partners um, in terms of, you know, what does the plan look like? What do we have to think about uh, first, second, and third? And so that's something that um, I'm really glad that we can work in tandem on that conversation. We just had um, a private company that works on, on batteries 
storage. I don't know if you guys read about that. Just come to, come to Harris County. Uh, a huge deal as well that's going to help make us more resilient. Um, but look, right now, securing the federal funding, that, that um, solar investment is major. Um, we're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and, you know, is it an, a 180 change? No, but it is something that is growing, um, and you have to start. And this will be a really good seed start. Um, the various uh, startups, I think it's great. Uh, we, what we all know is the scale is not there. And so um, what I want to do is really encourage that conversation um, and see how we can identify the types of support so that we can really lead on that um, at, a, at a broader scale. Uh, of course, visiting with our energy partners. And, and then finally, the work on workforce training, that focus on what are the jobs we're going to need later, how can we incentivize participation on that. Uh, the American Rescue Plan dollars helped us do that a lot, um, but of course, that money dries up. How can we make that sustainable for the future? Thank you so much. We we're just a couple minutes over, everybody. As you're looking over your shoulders on the way out, see the events that are coming up. I just want to thank you, Judge, for being here today. It's great to have this event back. It's great to have it in person. Thank you, thank you for everything you had to say. Thank today. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thanks again.